Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hello, folks. This is Ken Ford. My co-host, Don Kernagas, learned earlier this morning that she tested positive for COVID-19. It's just a mild case so far, and Don says she fully expects to be back on her feet soon. So, today's episode is going to be a little bit different. I'll be doing this interview solo. Speaking of COVID, we are now entering our third year of the coronavirus pandemic. Not only does COVID-19 and its variants continue to proliferate, but also the controversy surrounding COVID-19, like vaccine mandates, the effectiveness of masks in lockdowns, and the impact of school closings are all controversial, etc., etc., etc. Today's guest is quite familiar with these controversies. Dr. Martin Koldorf is an epidemiologist and a biostatistician who has gone on the record to describe the United States and the global response to COVID-19 as one of the biggest public health fiascos in history. As you would expect, he gained quite a bit of notoriety for his contrarian views. But Martin is not an uninformed contrarian. He has spent the last 30 years specializing in infectious diseases and the efficacy and safety of vaccines. He is a former professor at Harvard Medical School who has devoted most of his career to developing and applying statistical and epidemiological methods for the early detection and monitoring of infectious diseases. He also helped develop the Centers for Disease Control's current system for monitoring potential vaccine risks. His methods are widely used in monitoring COVID-19 in the United States as well as other countries around the world. Today, he is the Senior Scientific Director at the Brownstone Institute. Martin is also one of three authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, which was published in October of 2020 and argued against school closings, travel restrictions, as well as vaccine mandates even though Martin himself is generally a strong supporter of vaccines, just not the mandates. The three authors were immediately skewered for what critics called a radically dangerous approach to pandemic management. Martin was even accused of promoting mass murder for his opposition to lockdowns and school closings. But because here at STEM Talk, we appreciate that a curious, open, and even skeptical mind is at the heart of the scientific method, we have invited Martin to sit down with us to discuss his views about the pandemic and the best ways to safeguard the public. But before I get to my interview with Martin, I have some housekeeping to take care of. As regular listeners of STEM Talk already know, our highly esteemed Double Secret Selection Committee continually and carefully reviews iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps looking for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled five-star reviews to read here on STEM Talk. Now, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by Soccer Mama. The review is titled, STEM Talk Cures What Ails Your Brain. The review reads, You should become a regular STEM Talk listener today. The highlight of this podcast is the way that Ken, Don, and their guests share the way a teacher, a book, or an experience can blossom into a life well-lived in science. The episode with Dr. Chris Logothetis was a great listen that built my understanding of the way treatment of prostate cancer has evolved. STEM Talk will make you smarter, provided that you listen with your full attention. I promise that if you do, it will be worth the time you spend. Well, thank you, Soccer Mama, and thank you to all other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk 
become such a great success. Okay, and now on to our interview with Dr. Martin Koldorf. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Hello, this is Ken Ford, and I'm here with Martin Koldorf. Welcome, Martin. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. We're all looking forward to this very much. Martin, you were born in Lund in 1962, which is in southern Sweden. You grew up, however, in Umea, a university town in northeast Sweden. What prompted your family to make the move to Umea when you were only two years old? Uh, well, my father is an academic. Uh, he's a statistician, so he uh, uh, became a professor in a newly established university there, just south of the Arctic Circle. As an aside, I spent an enjoyable week at the University of Umea visiting a professor named Lars Erik Janlert. He is in computer science, no? Yes, he's quite good, actually. He's uh, connected to the field of AI, which is my field. And I served as an external expert for a PhD dissertation. And all in all, it was a, it was a good experience. Were you there in the summer or winter? Uh, it was the summer. Okay, so it was no dark. No, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was brisk, but very nice. And uh, the university was interesting. Uh, the dissertation event or defense was quite different than they are here. And uh, that was all an interesting experience. Uh, in Umeå, where I come from, in the winter it's dark, and in the summer it's never dark, it's always light. And uh, so it was a surprise for me when I was uh, in a teenager, I visited Germany in the summer, and it was just dark during the night and light during the day. That was very strange, because for me it's dark in the winter and light in the summer. <laughs> yes, I was a couple, maybe 10 years ago, I guess now, my life is flying by. I was in Antarctica, and uh, the lighting there is, is quite, quite unusual as well. So... Returning to your story, what were you like as a kid? What, you know, how, how would you characterize yourself as a child? Uh, I think it was qu uh, quiet, shy, uh, bookish, like to be outdoors. Sounds a lot like myself, actually. Maybe, yeah. I, 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 I still enjoy skiing. I still enjoy being outdoors. So, and I try to instill that in my children also, that love of nature. Mm. That's wonderful. That's a, uh, a gift that keeps on giving for their whole life. I think so, yeah. So obviously, as a child, you must have had a knack or at least an interest in mathematics. Uh, what was it that, that really drew you into math? Did it just come naturally, or was it something that evolved over time? Probably came natural, but I think one thing was when I was eight, I spent a year in the United States because my father was doing sabbaticals. So when I came to the U.S. in Texas, I was in second grade, but I couldn't, didn't know English. So I was doing very simple English but I was doing third grade mathematics. And of course, everything was difficult except the mathematics because I knew the numbers. That was the same uh, everywhere. Absolutely. So maybe that's, maybe that's what inspired me to do mathematics. I don't know. Not surprisingly, as an undergraduate, you did go ahead and attend uh, Umea University and majored in mathematical statistics, as I understand it. Decades later, the university would honor you with an honorary doctorate in 2020. When you accepted this honor, you credited the teachers at Umea for really inspiring your scientific interest. Could you elaborate just a little on this and explain this? Well, I think it was a big difference going from high school to university. There was more freedom to, to think, but also more inspiring uh, with the lectures from the professors and so on. And I had uh, a, a variety of very good professors, including some, including one, Kenneth Kaminsky from the United States. And that was very, very inspiring how you sort of, uh, the, the, the thrill of mathematics and probability theory and statistics and the puzzle solving and so on. I can imagine. Uh, for your postgraduate studies, you moved to the United States as a Fulbright Fellow to attend Cornell University, where in 1989, you earned your PhD in operations research. What led you to move to the States for your PhD studies, and what was it about operations research that really um, sort of floated your boat and it was so compelling to you? Well, I liked mathematics a lot, but I also felt that I don't want to do theoretical math because I wanted to do some work on real problems because uh, I was fascinated with the connection between mathematics and the reality of the world and how you can model the world with mathematics. So I didn't want to do a, a pure math or a pure statistics degree. And 
Operations research is an area which uses uh, mathematics very sophisticatedly, but it's to solve very practical problems. So that's what interested me with operations research. And there was no really good program in Sweden. Sweden is a fairly small country. So at that time, there was not really any good programs in operations research. And it was natural to uh, look at the United States. And I had lived in the United States as a child, so I always liked uh, the U.S. Mm. Yes, operations research is fascinating. And a, a lot of People in AI, such as myself, had exposure to operations research, perhaps at the master's degree level, and then later uh, continued their studies in AI. But there's a close connection between operations research and computer science and, and AI. Yeah, for sure. Earlier in your career, you developed software called SatScan. And this software analyzes spatial, temporal, and space-time data and is used for geographical and hospital disease surveillance. And it, it, it's really great. This software is free, and it's used in a wide range of fields as diverse as neurology, economics, geology, genetics, and so on. What led you to develop this software, and could you tell us a little bit about its role in detecting and understanding diseases? So... What led to it is uh, two pediatricians knocked on my door when I was at the faculty in Uppsala University in Sweden. They were pediatricians uh, focusing on treating leukemia, and they had the registry for all the leukemia cases uh, in Sweden for over many years. And there's always been sort of a hypothesis about that leukemia may cluster in different places geographically. And they wanted to know, are there any clusters, geographical clusters of leukemia in Sweden? Are there certain places where the risk of leukemia is, uh, is higher? Because we don't really know very much about what causes leukemia. So that would be sort of a hint of what may cause it. And uh, now and then, uh, there were frequently like an alarm that somebody saw that there's a few leukemia cases somewhere, and then the uh, health department has to do a huge investigation to see what might cause it and so on. But it's really a statistical problem because just by chance, there will be some areas that have more cases than others. So you would expect there to be some clustering somewhere, either a small cluster or a larger cluster, and maybe in the north or in the south, so who knows. So there was an interest to have a method that would look at to see if the pattern is such that any cluster that you detect is truly statistically significant, if it's truly so big that it would be unlikely to be due to chance or whether it's a likely chance occurrence. And you don't know if it's a small cluster or only like a few kilometers in radius, or if it's a big one, like a big chunk of a country. So you want to be able to scan the area with sort of a circular area to see everywhere and different sizes of your scanning window to see if there are uh, any clusters. And uh, Joe Naus at Rutgers University, and his colleagues, uh, Sylvain Wallenstein, Joe Glass, and others, had developed the th in statistics the theory of scan statistics, which is a really interesting and fascinating thing. But to use it in a setting for diseases like this, you have to adjust for the background population. And you want to make sure that you can look at different size circles and so on, and then adjust for it. So uh, it was a very practical problem to find out, are leukemia clusters real or are they not real? And uh, when we analyzed the data in Sweden, it turned out, I mean, you always find a cluster, but it turns out that the most likely cluster was not statistically significant. So it was all likely due to chance. And that has been an experience uh, for leukemia in other places also, that most often the clusters of leukemia are by chance. For other diseases, though, you can often find true clusters. And for example, infectious diseases, they're often true clusters. So you can also use this method to continuously, instead of using a circle in purely space, you use a cylinder in space-time. And then you can continuously, on a daily basis, monitor if there are any new emerging clusters of some infectious disease occurring, or salmonella, Legionnaire's disease, or, uh, or COVID, for example. Hmm. You mentioned you did this work at uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. And I presume that was, uh, you returned there immediately after finishing your PhD, is that right? Uh, not immediately, actually, because after I finished my PhD, I did something unusual. I went to Guatemala to work for a human rights organization. Ah. In Guatemala at the time, uh, there was a military uh, death squads who were kidnapping and disappearing and killing people. 
So we were a human rights organization that provided protective accompaniment so that if there are foreigners with these uh, student groups or women's groups or unions or campesino organizations and so on, if they have foreigners with them, there's less likely that something bad will happen to them. So we sort of created a space for them to fight for their rights and freedoms. And how long were you there? I was in Guatemala for, I think, half a year or so. Oh, it's quite a long time. And and what uh, drew you to Uppsala University? Uh, was that primarily the desire to return to Sweden, or was there something specific about that university? Uh, well, it's a very old, it's the oldest university in Sweden, so it's a very good university. But uh, I, I wanted to go back to Sweden, yeah, at the time. Mm. So, Martin, it seems as if you reached a certain point in your career where you became more interested in diseases and epidemiology than economics and other applications of your work. Today, your research is primarily focused on developing and applying statistical methods for disease surveillance. When and why did this real focus come about? Are are you aware of how that happened, or was it sort of a gradual evolution? Uh, I think it was gradually started with uh, these two pediatricians. Uh, but then uh, I moved back to the United States and I started to work at the National Institute of Health and the National Cancer Institute. They had a national interest also in this issue of uh, cancer clusters because it was taking a lot of time for many health departments. And often they were spending a lot of time investigating what turned out to be random noise. So it was good to have a method that could quickly distinguish the random noise that maybe didn't need to be investigated so thoroughly. Anything that was actually real and important to look into. That makes perfect sense. And, you know, one often hears of real or imagined cancer clusters and um, having a robust method to look at it and somebody with expertise to understand the data would be very valuable. Yeah, and it was very interesting, both from a mathematical, statistical point of view, as well as from the public health uh, perspective. Hmm. In addition to SatScan, uh, another free software package you developed is called TreeScan which is a data mining method that simultaneously looks for excess risk in a large number of individual cells in a database, as well as in groups of closely related cells. Can you talk a little bit about how this software is used for disease surveillance and describe some of the key features of this method? So uh, one example is, if, for example, in vaccine and drug safety surveillance. So suppose we have a vaccine, like a measles vaccine, for example, the And then we want to know, are there any adverse reactions to this vaccine? Now, when you have a new vaccine, there's always certain things that you are hypothesizing about. Maybe Guillain-Barre syndrome or Bell's palsy and so on. You always be look at. But there are many thousands different potential adverse outcomes that you might want to look at. So the thing is then, when you have a new vaccine, a new drug on the market, you might want to look at, does it cause anything unexpected that you didn't think of? So yes, you look at those things specifically that you have hypotheses and suspicions about, but you also want to look like very broadly in a data mining way. Is there anything here that we didn't expect, but it's actually there? Very interesting. And one can certainly see the application of this kind of uh, program. You're also the co-developer of the R sequential software program that is used for exact sequential analysis. Can you give our listeners a little bit of an overview of how this works and what this program is primarily used for? Yes, that's work I've done together with uh, Dr. Ivaria Silva at uh, Universidad Federal de Oro Preto in Brazil. And the, the, the idea here is that, again, if you do vaccine or drug safety surveillance, instead of waiting a year or two and then look to see if this vaccine causes this adverse reaction or this drug causes this adverse reaction. We want to look at it continuously over time. So I have for almost 20 years now been involved with the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which is a CDC program for monitoring safety of vaccines. And I don't think think it's probably 15 years from now, now, we decided to do something called rapid cycle analysis, where you look at it data on a weekly basis that it comes in from the various uh, health plans, like uh, the Kaiser, Northern California, and so on. Uh, so then we get data on a weekly basis. We got everybody who got the vaccine, and then we know everybody, did they have a seizure or not a seizure, for example, in the, in the few weeks after the vaccine. But then you have to do sequential analysis, which is something that uh, Abram Wald initiated in the 1940s. And it's commonly used in uh, clinical trials where you want to do monitoring over time to see if there are 
efficacy or adverse reactions and then stop the trial early if there's a problem. But to do it for in a clinical trial is sort of different from doing it in a disease surveillance setting. It came out of developing new methods for sequential analysis, specifically for surveillance, safety surveillance of vaccines and drugs. One can see how that would be useful. After spending three years at the National Cancer Institute, you moved to the University of Connecticut, where you spent the next six years. What uh, was the primary enticement to move you back into academia? I don't think it's so much of moving back because my work at NCI was very much in academia as well. It's not a university, but a research institute. So I don't think it was a huge difference there. It's just a different uh, place. Or to rephrase the question, uh, to a university setting. Yeah, so it was more for family reasons that I moved, and then I found a new job. So I would have been happy to... I'm, I'm very... I enjoy working both in a university setting as well as in a setting of a research institute. I mm. think both are good places to work. I agree. I've done both. In 2002, you took a position as a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Much of your research at Harvard focused on developing new statistical and epidemiological methods for disease surveillance. You also spent a lot of time looking at how to optimize health outcomes for individuals and populations. Can you talk a little bit about this work and give us some context for the work? So at Harvard, I worked a lot on the vaccine safety and drug safety. So that was probably my primary work. And this has, that has been my primary work for the last probably 20 years. I'm still working on the geographical aspects. And I'm working, for example, closely since many, many years with the New York City Health Department with their disease surveillance efforts. So I'm continuing with that. But most of my work late, uh, during the last two decades has been on drug and vaccine safety surveillance. Hmm. Several years ago, I know that you were part of a CDC uh, working group that looked at measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, also known as MMRV. For quite some time, the uh, MMRV vaccine in our country's high vaccination rates made these diseases uh, much less common in the United States. Can you talk about the working group and your key takeaways from this experience? Yeah, so just uh, so so I think it was Merck who. Uh, came up with the new vaccine. So before that, there was a vaccine called MMR, which is one needle that gives the child both the measles, mumps, and the rubella vaccine. And then they have a different needle for the varicella, the chickenpox. So uh, Merck came up with a new, new vaccine that had all these four in the same needle. So the advantage is that the child will get one needle in for four diseases instead of two needles for these four diseases. And if you ask any child uh, who is about to get vaccinated, they prefer one needle over two needles. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, so uh, as part of my work at the Vaccine Safety Data Link, we wanted to monitor uh, the safety of the new drug, or the MMRV. Uh, and it's given twice, one when children are about 12 to 18 months old, and the second time when they're around five years old. And uh, we were monitoring, one of the things we were monitoring was for febrile seizures, to see if there were any febrile seizures. And we found a signal after about, after about 25,000 people in our system had received the dose, we saw that there were more febrile seizures after the MMRV than after MMR. So CDC and the, their uh, advisor committee for immunization practices, ACIP, they had recommended to use the MMRV instead of the older vaccines for two reasons. One is to have fewer needles for the children, but also to make it easier to make sure that more children got the varicella vaccine uh, by getting it together with the, with the other one. But now when this new thing came out, that there was more febrile seizure, there was the question, is this a problem that is big enough that we sh that CDC should rec change the recommendations or not. And therefore, there was a working group put together to determine uh, whether that should be the case or not. And there was very general agreement that there was indeed an increased risk by one in 2,000 more who got a febrile seizure after uh, the MMRV vaccine compared to the MMR. So there was consensus about the magnitude of the issue. There was some difference in opinion whether 
this was a serious enough problem to recommend MMR or to still recommend MMRV because febrile seizures is not necessarily something life-threatening or doesn't have any long-term consequences. It's obviously scary for the parents. So there was sort of a discussion there, Should what is more important to, to have the MMRV, which will maybe get more people to get vaccinated, more children get vaccinated with the varicella, or is it more important to have the MMR, which has fewer adverse reaction, which is both good in terms of avoiding those adverse reactions, but also if you avoid adverse reactions, you also avoid increasing the, the hesitancy about vaccines, because if somebody has a seizure because of the vaccine, they will talk to their neighbors or their parents of their kid's class and say, hey, my kid had a seizure after the vaccine, and that should, could sort of generate more hesitancy and, and fear of the vaccine. So there was those kind of discussions. And uh, in the end, uh, what has happened is that this was only a problem for at the younger age. So right now, I think for the younger age, everybody gets MMR and varicella separate. And then for the five-year-olds, they typically get the combined MMRV vaccine. So I think that sort of ended up as the end result, which I think was a good end result. Yes, it, it, it sounds rational. Since uh, 2018, you've been a member of the FDA's Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee. Can you talk a little bit about this work and the role of the committee and how it interacts with the agency? Uh, yeah, so that's very interesting work, uh, I, I find it, and it's very important work. So FDA decides what drugs to approve and what not to approve, vaccines also, but this committee is specifically for drugs. Uh, and they can decide what they uh, on their own, but sometimes they want to have outside advice. So the pharmaceutical company will put in the application, FDA will have people who review it, and then they can either decide or they can dis uh, call in an advisory group. To have them evaluate. And that means that the pharmaceutical company is presenting, FDA is presenting, and then there are certain questions that we have to vote on or, or, or discuss. Uh, so it's, it's a way to help the FDA to get outside independent views on whether a specific drug should be approved or not, or under what conditions it should be approved, uh, or in some cases, even whether a drug should be withdrawn or not. I can imagine that that was in very interesting work over a period of time. You must have had some fascinating presentations and deliberations. Uh, that's very true. And those are actually public, so uh, anybody can uh, attend uh, as well as uh, I think they're also recorded, or at least the minutes is taken, so people can go back and see what the discussion was about these drugs. And sometimes we have had discussions where a drug is sort of uh, uh, it turned down, uh, sometimes uh, more positively, it's a good drug that uh, approved, and sometimes we recommend uh, approval under certain conditions. Mm. And of course, then FDA can decide after that to follow the, our advice or not. Uh, that's up to them, but they usually do follow the advice of these committees. Yes, we recently saw a case where they did not follow the advice of the external committee in the new Alzheimer's drug. Uh, yes, that was kind of shocking, actually, I think. It, it was. I, I've spent on a lot of federal advisory committees, not for drugs, but for other things. That was a, a major disconnect, very unusual. Yeah, one of my close colleagues, Aaron Kesselheim, he was on that committee, and he actually resigned from it because of this, together with two other members of that committee. And that's exceptionally, that exceptionally unusual to have yeah. committee members resigning. Yeah. No, that was a big shocker that the FDA would approve that. I want to back up for a second. In 1997, you were part of the World Health Organization's Disease Mapping Advisory Group. Can you tell us about this experience? And that had to be quite different dealing with uh, the WHO. What, what was that like? Oh, yeah, that was a long time ago, so I don't know how much I remember of it, but I will try. <laughs> so this had to do with uh, uh, the geographical distribution of disease and disease clusters and those things. How do we evaluate disease clusters? What statistical methods do we use? And how do you sort of approach it from a more holistic point of view? How do you incorporate the statistical methods into a bigger program? Do you do, for example, surveillance regularly looking at data, or do you... Uh, react when some news media, some mm. newspaper starts asking about uh, is there a cluster of this particular cancer in some town in Italy or wherever. And I think we came out, uh, sort of a, a book came out of, uh, edited book came out of there with certain recommendations and ideas for that. Throughout your career, um, you know, we've talked about your career thus far, 
and it's obvious that you've made significant contributions to the development of statistical and epidemiological methods for early identification of infectious disease outbreaks. But now turning to today's headlines, can you give listeners a sense of how your methods are used today to monitor COVID-19 in the United States and in other places too, of course? So I work closely with the New York City Health Department on that, and they are using the space-time scan statistic Obviously not to, in this case to detect it because it's already here, but to monitor it and see if there are shifts in the focus of COVID in, in New York City, for example. So is there suddenly a surge coming up in Staten Island or suddenly a surge in the southern part of Bronx or something? So they, they use this on a daily basis to, to look at, to sort of help monitor where there are surges and, and so on. They also use it to look at uh, different variants, if there are a certain, uh, a certain variant that uh, will suddenly uh, pop up. Mm. As you well know, a significant number of people have concerns about the safety of the coronavirus vaccine, and some people have concerns about all vaccines, of course. In terms of your surveillance work scrutinizing vaccine safety, what insights can you share with folks about the safety of the coronavirus vaccine specifically? And I know there are several of them, but in general. So first of all, no vaccine is 100% safe. There's uh, uh, always some uh, adverse reactions to vaccines, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take them. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't consider them safe enough to take. So in terms of the COVID vaccines, we knew already from the clinical trials that there were a number of mild adverse reactions soon after taking the vaccine, and especially after the second dose. So very sort of mild condition that might last for a day or two. And that's not unusual for vaccines, but I think they were more common after the COVID vaccine than after uh, most other uh, older vaccines. And that's something we sort of expect to a larger or smaller degree with any vaccine. There are a few other adverse reactions that we know about the vaccine. One is anaphylaxis, which is very rare. It happens usually within half an hour after getting the vaccine, but it is a serious uh, condition. So what happens is you want a sort of an allergic reaction. And it's, it's, so people are usually asked to stay around at the, uh, at the vaccination site for a while, just in case this happens so that there are healthcare personnel available to, to, to help and then, then it's, it's not fatal. So you don't want, for example, to have a drive-in vaccinations where people drive in with the car, get their shot, and then drive off because then if they're anaphylaxis when they're on the highway, that's not a good thing. So it, that's very, very rare, but it's something we know about, and it's important to know about it because it, it determines how we implement the vaccinations. We know that for the J&J vaccines, there are uh, rare cases of blood clots, especially in younger women under 50, uh, still rare. We know also that for Moderna, and also Pfizer, there are a risk for myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart. Uh, so we know that's the real adverse reaction. It's also rare, but it's, uh, we know it's real and it, it, uh, the vaccine increases uh, this risk. So uh, we know that there are, as, and that's what you would expect, so we shouldn't blame vaccines for that, but there are rare adverse uh, events that can happen after vaccination. And that's something we have to sort of, we learn more and more about it uh, the longer we, the more people who get vaccinated, the more we learn about it. Mm -hmm. Over the years, you helped develop actually key parts of the United States vaccine safety pro program or safety system. In 2020, you became a member of the CDC's COVID vaccine safety technical working group, which reviewed the COVID-19 vaccine safety data, I think on a weekly basis, when the United States began its vaccination program. But back in April of 2021, the CDC removed you from the working group after you publicly disagreed with the agency's pause of the J&J COVID vaccine for older Americans. I understand that some people quip, and I think this is kind of clever, that you are perhaps the only person who has been fired by the CDC for being pro-vaccine. At any rate, what were your key objections to the pause of the J&J vaccine? And uh, what were the issues that led to your removal from the safety group other than just disagreement? So we talked about the sequential analysis. So one thing that I'm sort of specialized in is to try to find problems as soon as possible. And actually, some of these methods we use are, is, is used continuously by CDC. Some of the methods I've developed, both the sequential as well as the tree scan methods. 
But what happened with J and J was we found uh, blood clots, but it was very clear that it was the the blood clots we found was mostly in they were all younger than fifty and mostly women. So I think uh, it made sense for CDC to take a pause on the J and J vaccine for definitely for women under fifty, but maybe everybody under fifty, because there were other alternatives. What the Pfizer and Moderna were were alternatives to J and J. And also, if you're under 50, your risk for dying from COVID is quite small. So I think that was a reasonable pause to do. But they decided to do a general pause for also for people above 50. And it was uh, clear from the data that th- there was no indication of any problems for those over 50. But it was actually stronger than that because so many people above 50 had been vaccinated and there was not a single case. So we know, knew that there wasn't a major problem in that age group. And that's also the age group that needs the vaccine the most, because while anybody can get infected by COVID, in terms of mortality, there's more than a thousandfold difference in risk, mortality risk between the oldest and the youngest. So it was absolutely critical to get as many older people as possible vaccinated as soon as possible. And this was during the height of the winter wave of COVID. So it was important to vaccinate as many, as many older people as, as quickly as possible. And one advantage of the J&J vaccine was that uh, it's a one dose. So there are certain populations that is harder to reach with two doses, for example, in rural areas or uh, homeless people and others uh, of more vulnerable. So by putting a pause on the J&J vaccine, immediately the use of the vaccine, of course, plummeted and, and it never regained. But by doing that, there were many people who should have gotten the vaccine, who would have benefited the vaccine or older people who didn't get it. And to be quite honest, I think some people probably died because of this pause of the J&J vaccine of older people. So it was perfectly reasonable to do a pause, I think, of the for those who were younger, because that's what the problem was, and there wasn't alternatives, and it was less urgent for them. But for the older people, it was very urgent to get vaccines. At that time, there was still a, a lack of supplies. Uh, the demand was higher than the supplies. So by taking one vaccine off mm-hmm. the market, the total supply also uh, uh, went down. Why do you think your uh, entirely sensible objection caused you to be removed from the group? Uh, I don't know, but I do know uh, that the head of CDC was involved in the decision, in the discussions of this decision. Yeah, that seems like a, a an unusual decision uh, for a rational dissent. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, when I was in the working group about 10 years earlier for the measles MMRV, measles monstral varicella vaccine, we also had working groups. And if there were different opinions, which there were, those different opinions were all communicated to the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices and to the CDC higher-ups. And I think that's a good thing because uh, if you're, uh, you you want to hear both the majority views and the minority views, but in this case from the COVID, minority views were not communicated mm. uh, up the up the sort of the hierarchy. And I don't know why that wasn't because to me that makes sense to to, to uh, sort of present. Okay, we had we have a committee of ten people. Seven people thinks this. Three people thinks this. Both might be reasonable, but they have the reason for thinking differently, and we'll just sort of present that to the more senior people in in CDC. Uh, But that didn't happen. That didn't happen uh, uh, for the COVID vaccine, Hmm. and and that's normally how it would work. Um, And uh, COVID seems unique in the imperative to have a single narrative, and we'll probably come back to that. But uh, I've been on lots of panels for the government, and if there's a dissenting view. Typically, leadership wants to know it. Yeah, I said if I was in a leadership position, I certainly would like to know uh, both the majority and the minority views and the rationale for both. Exactly. So back to the CDC, uh, they're now recommending the Pfizer BioNTech COVID nineteen vaccine for children five years old through eleven, as well as children twelve to seventeen. What are your thoughts, and what advice do you have for parents on this? Uh, this is a, a controversial topic. Uh, so before answering that, I want to say that older people who have not had COVID already, it's very important for them to get vaccinated. Because even though it's not going to prevent getting infected, 
because we know that the vaccines, their, their ability to prevent infections, infection, that wanes quite rapidly within a few months. But there is protection against serious disease and death, and that's, of course, what's most important. So uh, people who are older, about 50, about 60, and so on, uh, I think it's a no-brainer that they should get the vaccine unless they already have had COVID, because if they've had COVID, they already have very good uh, natural immunity from having recovered from the disease. Uh, and even though there are small risks, as there are with all vaccines and drugs, since the benefit of the vaccines is so great, even if the risk, if there are some small risks, the benefits outweigh the, the small risk. Now, if we go to children, it's a completely different calculations, because Children also can get the disease and they get the disease, but it's typically very mild, uh, either asymptomatic. My six-year-old daughter had COVID and she didn't have any symptoms at all. Uh, she was five at the time, but because it was last year, but the risk of death is minuscule. So if you go back uh, in years past with the annual influenza, there would typically be 200 to 1,000 children each year who die from the seasonal flu. And the risk of dying from COVID is less than that. So there are many, many things that's much more dangerous for children to do, uh, I think, including uh, driving to and from schools, having a car accident, and so on. So the risk is very, very small for them if they contract COVID. At the same time, there are risks with uh, vaccines, and they're also small, but we don't know uh, all the risks yet. There might be more. The risks that we do know about, like uh, myocarditis and blood clots, that tend to be more in younger adults than in older adults, but we don't know exactly how that carries through down to the childhood. Also, the children have a vaccine that's uh, less potent, uh, so that might be in less adverse reactions. But we don't know everything about the vaccines among children. But since the benefits it's so limited, even a small risk means that the risk could be higher than the benefit. So uh, I don't recommend children to be vaccinated. And then, of course, you have to ask questions, well, where's the cutoff? Well, that's sort of unclear, I think. I think what's clear is that uh, if you're older people and you haven't had COVID, then yes, you should get vaccinated. Uh, if you're a, ch a child, don't need it. And of course, if you've had COVID, we, we know that the natural immunity is very strong from, from having survived or uh, recovered from COVID, so, we, so they don't need the vaccine either. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense, and it, it seems like a matter of a straightforward risk-reward ratio in uh, a young population. When you think of the the risk and the reward, it's a very different calculus, like you said, than for older people. Yes, it is. So as we've started to discuss, you've been generally a critic, not only of the United States' response to COVID-19, but to the global response as well. And I recall that you've described this as the biggest public health fiasco in history, and uh, I have no doubt you're right. You and two other scientists, Sunitra Gupta from Oxford and Jay uh, Katichara from Stanford, penned the Great Barrington Declaration. And this document raises concerns about the damaging physical, mental health, and especially economic impacts of the prevailing COVID-19 policies and responses. So instead of lockdowns, the three of you recommended what you called focused protection. Before we talk about focused protection, though, can you explain why you think lockdown policies have produced these devastating effects on both the short and long-term public health? Yeah, so one of the basic principles of public health is that you can't look only at one disease. You have to look at health as a whole. And you can't just look at it short term in terms of disease this month and next month. You have to look at it over a few years. So what lockdowns do is does two things. One thing, it generates a lot of collateral public health damage on other outcomes. And we have seen that tragically, I think. We have that uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes have been worse. Uh, the diabetes, people don't get the diabetic treatment they need. Immunization rates have gone down. People, children and others getting their vaccines. If you look at cancer, there's been less cancer screening and less cancer treatment. That's not going to result in more deaths this year. But somebody who, if it's not detected, then it's, let's say, a cervical cancer. If it's not detected, maybe uh, that woman will die three or four years from now instead of living another 15, 20 years. So those are long-term consequences of these lockdowns that we will sort of have to live with and die with for many years to come. Of course, the mental health 
has been a big problem from these lockdowns. And then there's, then there's other things, for example, the closing of schools. Schools are very important for children. Uh, it's very important for the education. It's very important also from the social development and also for their physical health. So to close schools for a long term, that, that can never be sort of, you can never catch up with that because you can suddenly start and have uh, twice as much school in the next year or 50% more school in the next few years. So that year, or you know, for some kids now, almost two years that were lost, they, they can never be sort of regained. So that's something also that this population, mm. these children have to live with for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. And uh, I, I think these kinds of harms are often not accounted for and, and not recognized. You know, earlier I mentioned uh, focused protection and that the three authors of the Barrington uh, Declaration thought that focused protection would be a more rational response. Could you talk a little bit about focused protection and explain how it's different from the response that most uh, countries have taken? Yeah, so it goes back to the fundamental principle of the nature of COVID. The key thing is not how dangerous it is, is in terms of what strategy you use. The key thing is that we have a risk differential. And for COVID, that risk differential is primarily by age. That's by far the biggest risk factor to be older. I think the risk for mortality doubles every five to seven years or so in age. So anybody can get infected. Everybody do gets infected. But the risk of severe disease and the risk from dying is, as I said, more than a thousandfold difference between the old and the young. So if you have COVID as an enemy, which it is, you have to use, utilize the weaknesses of the enemy. And that means we have to protect those people who are old and at high risk, while we can let children and other young people to live uh, near normal lives so that they don't get the collateral damage or the average reactions from school closures and other things. And there was the belief, I think, among many politicians and some uh, scientists, virologists and immunologists and so on, that you protect the old by protecting everybody. But it doesn't work like that. But because they felt that by, by doing lockdowns you would protect the old, they never implemented sufficient focus protection of older people. So, for example, nursing homes, that's the way they have the most high-risk and frail people. We should have had a situation where we did less staff rotation so that it spreads less from staff. It's usually the staff who brings it on into the nursing homes. We should have had, we should have used staff that had natural immunity that, that had recovered from COVID because they are the least likely to pass it on and still are. They are still the least likely to pass it on to the residences, even compared to vaccinated staff. We should have done for staff who hadn't had COVID, there should be frequent daily testing. I think at some point uh, there was testing, but maybe on a, on a bi weekly or weekly scale, but it should have been done on a daily basis, as well as, of course, testing our visitors. And of course, we shouldn't send sick patients from hospitals back into nursing homes. That's sort of... That's amazing. Uh, and actually, that's still being done. It was still recommended recently by the, the governor, Ned Lamont of Connecticut. And it's just amazing because it certainly failed in New York and New Jersey. So I don't understand how any state would pick up and uh, suggest doing that. Do you know what the rationale for that was? Uh, the rationale is to... Uh, Alleviate crowding or... Open up uh, beds in the hospitals. Yeah. But uh, then you have to establish uh, a specific place where you can send these older people instead of to send them to nursing homes to have a special place to, to, to keep them until they are fully recovered for a few days or for, for a few weeks. I remember the experience with that kind of policy in New York, and it, it was astoundingly bad. It's hard to imagine why Connecticut would even contemplate reenacting it. Yeah, I think there were thousands and thousands of nursing home residents who died because of that policy. So it's very tragic. Incredible. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition perception, locomotion, and resilience. And, uh, you know, we're talking about nursing homes and hospitals. 
and the strength of the relative strength, that is, of the immunity uh, that one gets from having had COVID. And yet hospitals, including ones I'm very familiar with, are firing caregivers who refuse to take the vaccine. So this seems like a wrongheaded policy. Yeah, I think if the hospitals were smart, they would actually hire nurses and physicians who have recovered from COVID because they have the best immunity. They have to protect the patients the best. So for, for example, the geriatric wars in the hospitals, uh, even though if the patients have been vaccinated, they are still at risk uh, of dying from COVID. So that's where you want to sort of minimize the risk of uh, transmitting COVID. So for those high-risk uh, geriatric ward patients, I think... Uh, it would make sense to only use nurses and physicians there who have recovered from COVID because they have the least the risk of passing it on to the patients. So instead, uh, they are firing nurses and physicians who uh, have had COVID and recovered and therefore have the best immunity. They are firing them and they should hire them. Uh, so there's no uh, public health or scientific logic in doing this. So it's sort of a political issue that has uh, unfortunately gone astray. Yes, <clears throat> this seems to be sort of part of the landscape these days. Uh, nothing about COVID is discussed without lots of emotion and sort of a political lens laid over it, which is very unfortunate. Yes, as a native of Sweden, this political thing is kind of strange because in the U.S., the focus protection has been sort of championed by Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida, who is a Republican. Uh, in Sweden, uh, it has been championed by uh, the Swedish government, uh, who is a social democratic government, so a socialist government on the left. So I guess uh, that makes me a little bit schizophrenic here, because I guess in Sweden, I'm a left winger, and in the US, I'm a right winger, if you would sort of uh, <laughs> believe these, uh, uh, these COVID narratives, but it's just sort of in a sense silly. It uh, is very silly. I think in, uh, in public health, we really do have to care about everybody in society. We can't decide that we don't care about certain groups. So as public health scientists, uh, we have to care about everybody. We have to be willing to talk to everybody. We have so, I have been appear on media that is both right-wing and left-wing and everything in between, because I think that's the responsibility of a public health scientist during a crisis, because this pandemic is a, is a major health crisis. So then we have to be open and talk to everybody and sort of put uh, the politics aside for a while. Agreed completely. And, uh, uh, turning to research, a recent Israeli study that looked at a group of people who had already experienced COVID and thus had natural immunity. And this was back in the early part of last year of 2021. According to the researchers, the study demonstrated that natural immunity confers, as you said, longer lasting and stronger protection against infection, symptomatic disease, and hospitalization than even the two dose vaccine induced immunity. And this study also showed that people who received, for example, the Pfizer vaccine were 6.7 times more likely to be reinfected than people with gained natural immunity from actually contracting COVID. Now, this study has not been peer-reviewed yet, as far as I know, at least the version I read had not been peer-reviewed yet. And it focused just on Israelis who received the Pfizer vaccine. But can you give us your initial thoughts? about what this research shows in terms of an immune hierarchy. And I think you've already tipped your hat on this, but an immune hierarchy related to the coronavirus. So I often review papers for journals, uh, and this is my area of expertise. So while it has technically not been peer-reviewed and published in the peer-reviewed journals, uh, I have read the paper, and I think I'm a, pretty, I'm a somewhat decent peer reviewer. So for my own benefit, I view it as peer-reviewed because uh, I did it and several of my colleagues read it. I think it's a very good study. One thing they do is they, they compare the raw numbers or the raw benefit, and then you get this, uh, uh, I think it was 6.7 times uh, more protective from having recovery versus the vaccine. But those who recovered, they had recovered earlier because the vaccines came later. So that's natural. So if you adjust for the timing of having had COVID versus having the vaccine, it's actually a 27-fold higher risk of having symptomatic disease after the vaccine compared to those who have recovered. Wow. I should also say that there was also a difference in hospitalizations, but the confidence was much wider. So it's, it's sort of hard to tell exactly how, how big the difference was. But I should also say that in this study, the protection against death, uh, there was zero deaths in both groups, both in the vaccinated group and in those who had recovered. 
So in terms of deaths, both uh, the vaccinated and the recovered were, were, were well protected in this study. Do we know, uh, is there a difference in the degree of protection afforded somebody that contracts, for example, Omicron as opposed to Delta variant, or would any variant afford the same degree of protection? I don't think we know about Omicron yet. At least I haven't seen those studies. But it's a little bit difficult to sometimes tease apart what is due to a new variant coming. So, so, so if you see that there's waning immunity, is it waning immunity because it wanes over time? Or is it waning immunity because we now have a new variant for which it doesn't give as much protection? So it's not always easy to tease out uh, those differences in these observational studies. And, you know, one could imagine that Omicron might have a significant silver lining if it was sufficiently mild in terms of symptoms. And, uh, you know, you can imagine uh, a young, healthy population sailing right through that and then having a good degree of protection. Yeah, so we definitely know that the mortality from Omicron is less. At the same time, we don't know exactly how much of that reduction is due to this being a, a variant that just might be less less uh, deadly, how much is due to pe more people being vaccinated now, so there's still like sort of a vaccine protection, and how much is due to more people having natural immunity from having recovered from COVID. So we don't quite know exactly how much of that reduction in severity is due to each of these three components. Right, and, and one can easily see how that would be difficult to tease apart. Yes, especially now since uh, uh, there are very few people left who have neither had the vaccine nor have had COVID. Right, right. Moving back to uh, talking about the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, the John Snow Memorandum was published in The Lancet, and it's a response by 80 researchers denouncing the declaration. This uh, memorandum, in, for the listeners, it takes its name from John Snow, the famous epidemiologist who worked on the 1854 Broad Street cholera outbreak. And essentially, the memorandum counters the idea of herd immunity and calls it a dangerous fallacy unsupported by the scientific evidence. Obviously, you disagree. Well, it's sort of an astonishing thing to claim that herd immunity doesn't exist because that's a well-established scientific phenomena, just like gravity. And to talk about a herd immunity strategy also doesn't make any sense because whatever strategy we use for COVID, we will eventually reach herd immunity sooner or later. It's inevitable. <laughs> Correct, yes. Yeah. So it's not a question of whether we get to herd immunity. It's how do we minimize mortality and morbidity on our way to herd immunity? So it's like if you fly an airplane, you don't talk about the pilot using a gravity strategy to land the airplane. I mean, whatever strategy the pilot uses, the gravity will, will eventually ensure that the plane hits the ground. And the point of the purpose of the pilot is to land it safely with uh, hopefully no casualties. So it's very strange when people talk about criticize something for being a herd immunity strategy, herd immunity strategy because that's just... a that is the scientific phenomena that exists, and we are going to get there. Yeah, I, I was frankly amazed when I read that, it, it, and the degree of sort of emotion and passion and, frankly, anger in many of these responses is very atypical of scientific discussion. Maybe only a few other fields of science generate this degree of passion and conviction that anybody who disagrees with this particular dominant narrative is a bad person is a bad human. I know, it, you know, you see it in very few areas, but uh, I hope it's not a trend that spreads uh, more widely in science. I hope so too. And of course, passion is always good to have, but we have to have scientific discourse. And if there are different views on something so important like the pandemic, I think the right approach is for those who are in leading positions in the scientific community, like, for example, editors of journals or the heads of big funding agencies or university professors or medical school deans to sort of gather uh, and have uh, uh, open uh, and uh, polite uh, but frank uh, scientific discourse about these things. And there were a few of those, but it was very limited. Absolutely. It's, uh, this whole experience has been disappointing, uh, at least to me. 
You've been a proponent of the approach that's been followed by Sweden, for example. Sweden was the only Western country that, as far as I know, the only one that didn't close its schools. Actually, when you look at Sweden's response, it's sort of been the diametrical opposite of ours here in the United States, as well as most other Western nations. Can you talk about Sweden's response, how they handled COVID thus far, and some of the key lessons and insights that we should take away from their experience? So Sweden didn't do a strong lockdown as did in the U.S., for example, and Canada and most other Western European countries. And one example is the one you said, uh, even during the first wave in the spring of 2020, all the daycare centers were open and schools for all children ages 1 to 15. And uh, I think that was the appropriate decision to keep the schools open because schools are important for children, but also there were no negative consequences in terms of the COVID. There are, in Sweden, have 1.8 million children in this age group 1 to 15. And during this first wave in the spring of 2020, the number of those children who died from COVID was exactly zero. And there was just a handful of hospitalizations. At the same time, the COVID risk for teachers were lower than the average of other professions. And that includes actually other professions who were staying at home. So even that, so so there was very little spread of this disease within the schools. And that's natural because children do not spread this disease as much, uh, very much. It's mostly spread by adults. And when they were spread in schools, uh, it was more likely to be from teacher to teacher than from children to uh, to teachers. And this was done without any mask, without any testing of children. So uh, when a child was sick, they were told to stay home, uh, whether it was COVID or something else. But there was no testing and no no, no mask and no, no social distancing. So they, Swedish children, were able to live a normal life. And I think they have benefited greatly from that. I would say also that the other Scandinavian class countries followed also a strategy that was fairly similar to Sweden. They did close the schools for a while in the spring of 2020, but in generally, Denmark, uh, Finland, and Norway have also uh, adapted a, a strategy which very limited uh, lockdown measures. There were there were some, but in all four countries, uh, very limited. And I think there might even have been less lockdowns in some of the uh, Scandinavian neighbors than in Sweden. Yeah, and they did very well. I mean, some of those countries had remarkably uh, good experience compared to the rest of their European neighbors. Yeah. So so one thing, uh, it's not only a uh, good thing with Sweden. So one thing Sweden did badly was in the nursing homes. And I would say specifically the nursing homes in Stockholm, the capital. Stockholm was the, was the worst hit. And uh, Sweden did not do a good job protecting nursing home residents in Stockholm. And that led to a lot of unnecessary death, I think. So it wasn't a perfect example at all. But uh, yeah, I think the Scandinavian countries have among the lowest COVID mortality in Euro- among the European countries. So, Yes. And, uh, you know, you think that that, um, that experience would inform policy, uh, but it doesn't seem to. Yeah, it was very surprising because I thought back in 2020 that, okay, uh, Sweden has schools that are open and that will go well. And therefore, uh, everybody will open the schools back then in, in August of 2020. But it was very strange in the US, for example, the New England Journal of Medicine, they published a, sort of a review of the evidence about schools and whether they should be open or not. And in this review that was published, I think, in July of 2020, they didn't even mention Sweden. So here we have one country, one major Western country who kept schools open uh, throughout the whole first wave and with zero death. And it wasn't even mentioned in this uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper. So that's like doing a, a clinical trial of a new drug and not, uh, not reporting uh, the data from the control group and to compare with that. So that was sort of astonishing that they were published a uh, paper like that without that information. And that was all... That was already available from uh, the public health agency in Sweden. They have put out a report uh, about the the results from the Sweden. I think it is astonishing and worrisome because it's this wasn't uh, an omission made by mistake. Uh, I, this data was available, and uh, I'm shocked that reviewers didn't point this out pointedly. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure why 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 that why it was like that. Uh, looping back for a minute, you know, we talked earlier about the degree of venom and sort of anger 
that uh, greeteth the Great Barrington Declaration. And then we just talked about the experience in Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries. William Hazeltine, a former Harvard Medical School professor, literally said that herd immunity is just another word for mass murder. And, you know, even as a person not in the field, pretty much everyone has heard about herd immunity and it's seen as a scientific fact. That seemed to be a shocking thing for him to say. And in 2020, he said that if we allow this virus to spread in an attempt to reach herd immunity, that we're talking about two to six million American deaths as a consequence. Well, this hasn't happened. It hasn't happened here. It hasn't happened in Sweden. Do you think, uh, have we gotten to the point where there's any shift in the scientific community to think a little bit differently about the appropriate responses to COVID? Or do you think we're still in sort of a a single path and any deviation from that path is greeted with uh, anger and scorn? Uh, Well, I don't think so many scientists would uh, concur with his description of herd immunity because what herd immunity is, is that once a certain percentage of the population has been infected and they are immune, whether by infection or vaccine, but once you have a certain percentage that are immune, then the virus can no longer spread because this, the virus can only spread if each sick individual infects uh, one or more, more than one uh, additional individual. And if it's less than one, then they will, will, will peter out. So what herd immunity means is that there's enough people who are already immune that uh, the virus can no longer circulate. And therefore, those who haven't had it yet, they will be protected by the herd. Of course. And uh, now, we don't know what that what that percent needed is for herd immunity and it depends on who is sick because if it's somebody delivering food they they versus somebody who's always at home and never meet somebody so it depends on 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 who gets sick what that percentage is and it also differs by different geographical areas and it varies also by season so in the summer in the northern hemisphere in the summer the herd immunity threshold is lower and in the winter is higher so to, to claim that herd immunity is sort of a, something of a mass murder, that's to claim like that gravity is responsible for the mass murder, right? Uh, because of, uh, of airplanes crashing. But actually, no, actually, I would, I would, I take that back because herd immunity is actually something that protects things. Once you have herd immunity, you can protect it. So the idea about focus protection is that you protect those who need protection because they're at high risk. And then once herd immunity kicks in, they are protected by the herd immunity. And then the, we, and so we can go back to normal lives. That's the whole basic idea about focus protection. Right. I, I wish that uh, this opinion that was stated really strongly by William Heseltine was not widely shared. But when you loop back to the Snow Memorandum that we discussed earlier, you know, they had 80 uh, researchers sign this thing without any shame, apparently, calling herd immunity a dangerous fallacy and yet it's 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 not a a matter of being a fallacy or not it's 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 just a fact of this world we live in well the stunning thing with the uh, john snow memorandum and the reason why they said that i think is that they questioned national immunity after having recovered from covid they question the existence of that. And to me, that's very surprising because, well, first of all, even before we knew anything, before we had any data, just by historical examples, you expect that once people recover from a disease, they will have immunity. We've known that for about two and a half thousand years now, since at least the 430 BC during the Athenian plague, where they knew that if you had recovered from the plague, you wouldn't get it again. So therefore, you could use those people as nurses, for example, to care for the sick. Uh, so this is sort of very old, old knowledge. And there's no reason to believe, there was never any reason to believe that we wouldn't have immunity after recovering from COVID. And we saw from the Israel studies, but also over a hundred other studies that we have very good immunity after recovering from COVID. But uh, this sort of strange thinking is still prevalent because when we now fire nurses, who have recovered from COVID. You have nurses who they worked during the height of 2020 during the uh, pandemic. They worked in the COVID wars and they get infected and then they stay home for a while and then go back. And now they are immune. But then in 2021, they were fired, even though they have better immunity than the vaccinated. So there's no sort of, and, and this is done by university hospitals. Um, who should know better, who should be enlightened, who should understand the, the science. 
So it's very, very strange. And I think so, th- so this sentiment that the Jon Snow Memorandum said questioning immunity after natural infection, that has, still has consequences now uh, with, these, uh, with the firing of people with natural immunity. It's incredible. And, uh, you know, when you think about the lockdowns, for example, it, it, you know, the damage from the lockdowns uh, is particularly severe for folks that have to get out and work, you know, sort of working people, people that do various trades. And it's much less severe for the class of people that make these policies. So if you think about who, who generates these policies, you could call them the Zoom class and the sort of social cluster and economic cluster of people who can easily do their work from home via Zoom is very, very different than, you know, the working class Americans and other, and other people around the world. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, there was there was work from home administrators who fired the nurses. So the administrators, they had the vaccine, the nurses had the national immunity, and uh, the administrators fired the nurses because they didn't get have the vaccine because they had national immunity instead. But I mean, it's also uh, bigger than that, because uh, if we look at the data from various cities, including uh, New York, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Toronto, and so on, we, we know that it was the working class who had most COVID and who died most from COVID. So the lockdowns worked in the sense that it, it, it shifted the burden of the disease from the more affluent uh, Zoom class or laptop class to the working class. So we protected young uh, journalists, young uh, scientists, young uh, administrators or bureaucrats or, or, or lawyers, bankers and so on, who could work from home, despite having a very minuscule risk from dying from COVID. At the same time as uh, older working class people in their 60s uh, were driving a cab or driving a bus or delivering uh, food or working in the restaurant kitchen to deliver uh, food to the Zoom class, they were the ones who were infected and therefore uh, uh, got the disease. And of course, most survived, but some of them died, uh, unfortunately. And then we now have a situation where those who have natural immunity, they are not allowed to go to the restaurants in New York City, for example, even though they have the best form of immunity, while the Zoom class of people who got vaccinated, they are free to, to go to the restaurants. So I think the these uh, pandemic restrictions that we have is, in my view, the the biggest assault on uh, on the working and middle class uh, since uh, segregation and the Vietnam War. Yes, and and one wonders what motivates it. It it can't be entirely motivated by ignorance at this point. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's a big question. I don't know the answer to that question. Me either, but it's it's curious. And turning back to the United States, as you well know, New York State and California, just to pick two, have both had long periods of quite strict lockdowns in 2020 and 2021. Florida, on the other hand, had a much shorter lockdown period and reopened businesses and tourism and schools much sooner than most states. And Florida has explicitly rejected mask mandates and vaccine mandates in general. A lot of people have second-guessed Florida's approach to COVID. And, you know, if you travel around the country and you tell them that you live in Florida, people ask you, oh, it must be bad there. You know, they, they listen to their, the news. But in terms of the CDC's age-adjusted COVID mortality rates, Florida is kind of like Sweden in that the catastrophe that was supposed to happen didn't happen. So in September, when we first looked at these numbers, New York had perhaps one of the worst age-adjusted COVID mortality rates with 273 deaths per 100,000. Florida and California had essentially identical mortality rates at 192 deaths per 100,000. And Florida and California are great contrasts in that they had dramatically different approaches, and yet, at that time, identical outcomes. And, you know, this data reflects the original outbreak of COVID and the summer surge of the Delta variant. So half of the nation had higher age-adjusted mortality rates than Florida, and half the nation had a lower rate. So, you know, I'm wondering about your takeaways on this. Yeah, so uh, I think it kind of shows that uh, the disaster that people expected in Florida never happened. I mean, I have the, the, the most recent numbers that I had from last week is that uh, the U.S. has a mortality rate per 100,000 of about 250. And Florida is slightly below that, and at 228, uh, 
this is age adjusted. California is uh, also slightly below the national average, that's 220. While, for example, New York is higher than the, it's, the national it's average. It's over 300, three yeah. Yeah. Now, this, the, the lowest ones are Vermont and Hawaii and Maine, sort of more isolated uh, states. So why can't, why can't make too many conclusions from comparing one state to another? Because there's many factors that are going into that. But if focus protection has, of course, major benefits in that it, re it minimizes the interruption of society and the collateral public health damage. And we see that if we look at Florida, it's, it's doing uh, slightly better than the U.S. average at this point. Yes, and uh, and essentially has stayed open. So the the economic impact and the cultural and psychological impact, I would argue, has been less. Yeah, and the impact on other uh, other uh, health outcomes is important. And of course, also the eco economy is important in itself. But the, having a healthy economy, we also know that uh, that improves public health. So in, so there's also that indirect. Yes. Uh, effect on health. Turning back to Omicron for a minute, as you mentioned earlier, the good news is that it seems to be a milder variant. More importantly, uh, you know, we just don't see anywhere near the deaths we saw last summer during the Delta surge. What's on the television now 24-7, though, is about children being hospitalized because of Omicron. And according to the CDC, this is a fact. Could you give us your thoughts on what is going on with all of this and why are more children being hospitalized currently? So a lot of children have been hospitalized for RSV, which is another respiratory virus. So that's partly causing, I think, the increase in uh, children hospitalizations. But we also have to differentiate between being uh, hospitalized with COVID versus uh, because of COVID. So as we have more and more people getting uh, infected now during this uh, winter wave, even people who are hospitals for other reasons, they might have test positive for COVID and therefore they will be counted as the COVID case. But I have seen no indication that Omicron is more serious or more dangerous to children than any previous variants. Yes, uh, but, but uh, that's the current story, right? So if, uh, if you're unfortunate enough to watch television, you would think just the opposite. Uh, yeah, and I think maybe that's part of, and, and that's, that's, I guess, another principle of public health. Public health, in public health, you don't try to f make people scared and, and make them fear disease. You try to, uh, sort of give accurate information. And we know from survey data that a lot of people think that, uh, COVID is more dangerous than it truly is. And we also see a difference between ages. So, among older people, there are a lot of people who think it's less dangerous than it actually is for them. Mm -hmm. But in more, but among younger adults, people you know, almost universally think that COVID is more dangerous for them than it actually is. So people don't understand this huge gradient in risk by age. Absolutely. I'm sure that's right. And it, and anecdotally, just among my friends, that's what I hear. The uh, younger folks, the colleagues and friends are very, very, very worried in, about COVID and, you know, wear their mask in their car uh, by themselves. And uh, the older people that maybe should uh, take it a little more seriously are sort of uh, from a robust earlier generation, I think, and, uh, and much less concerned. Yeah, so, so, so I have my oldest son, he's 19 now, and throughout this pandemic, I have not been concerned about him, about COVID. What I have been concerned about is that he needs to have a good social life, not just sit by himself in his room. So I have throughout the pandemic urged him to go out and play basketball with his friends, uh, hang out with them, do other things and uh, have a proper social life because I was much more scared of any mental health impact on him. Absolutely. Than on, than on COVID. In, in, in young people, we see a lot, uh, there's a lot of mental health problems reported presumably as a partial consequence of COVID and the response to COVID. Yeah, the mental health problems has gone up both for younger people as well as, uh, uh, as others. Martin, uh, we hear people talking uh, about COVID and they talk about it often as, well, this is the period of COVID and then we'll be done with this, you know, post-COVID we hear. And yet there's no post-flu, right? We, we will have the flu forever, or at least for a, an approximation of forever. 
And I'm wondering uh, what you think about this and if it's true that it won't just go away. You know, what, what do you think? Uh, should the focus be more on specific protection of vulnerable groups, as you suggested, or mitigating risk? You know, this, this is a topic where people, I, th- I think, are not being realistic. I, I personally don't see it just, quote, going away. Yeah, so there's sort of two answers to that question. One is that, correct, COVID is never going to go away. We can always have COVID uh, around, just like we have four other common coronaviruses that we have been living with for uh, our whole lives and more. So no, COVID is not going to go away. It's going to become endemic. Uh, On the other hand, the pandemic is going to end, just like every other pandemic ends. Uh, It hasn't ended yet because we have many... Many people are getting infected right now, but we are approaching the time when a large proportion of people have been infected, which means that we are approaching the stage of herd immunity. And once we read herd immunity, we won't have these waves anymore. We don't have this pandemic. There might be like uh, every winter season, there might be uh, more cases than in the summer and so on, little wave. But we're not going to have this huge thing that we have seen for the last c- a couple of years. We will enter an endemic sort of equilibrium stage where there will be a few cases they will be circulating, but uh, most will be mild because people have immunity from prior infections. And uh, most maybe will be asymptomatic, but somebody would have like a, a, a mild cold. Uh, children, of course, when they are born, they don't have any immunity to this. They are susceptible, but we know that for children, this is a very mild disease. So they will get it the first time as a child, and therefore it will not be a big deal for them. Uh, there will be older, frailer people who will continue to die from COVID every year because uh, they have a weakened immune system. So they might have COVID and they maybe get pneumonia, just like they do now. A lot of older people die every year, uh, frail people die every year from the flu or from other viruses, uh, usually by way of, or often by way of pneumonia. So that's going to be, we are going to enter such an endemic stage where we live with it, but it won't be the kind of problem that we've had during the last two years, because everybody will have, or almost everybody will have some form of immunity. Uh, When COVID came, everybody was susceptible. Nobody had immunity. So therefore, we had this huge pandemic. So therefore, the pandemic is going to end, and COVID will be similar to other viruses that we already know how to live with. So we can therefore go back to normal. But unfortunately, this idea that we could sort of get rid of COVID, I think that has created a lot of damage. Mm. I agree. Because there, there was this at thought that we could just get rid of it. Uh, and for me, as an infectious disease epidemiologist, it was clear, not from the Wuhan data, but as soon as it came to Italy and Iran, which was the two countries outside of China that was hit the, the first uh, in, a, in a very harsh manner, as soon as I heard about that, it was clear to me that this was going to be a pandemic that would hit every part of the world. And there was no way that we could avoid it sort of spreading. Because if you compare, for example, to SARS-1, uh, which is also a coronavirus that we had before, that was more deadly, but it was also less contagious. But that meant that we actually knew, for example, we had an outbreak in Toronto. That was one of the biggest, I think, the biggest in North America. But we knew exactly who brought it into Toronto and when and who that person uh, infected and so on. So uh, when you have that information, then you can use uh, contact tracing and isolation to sort of suppress it. But uh, with Italy and Iran, we had no idea who brought it to Italy. We don't even know who the second or third or fourth person were. So it was very obvious, if you look at it from uh, infectious disease epidemiology and how probability works in in, in various network structures and so on, that this was going to spread to everywhere uh, sooner or later. And what the lockdown did was basically just postpone it. It prolonged it. And of course, it had all the collateral damage from yeah. the lockdowns. Yeah, the, do you remember early on, you know, we were supposed to uh, take two weeks to flatten the curve. I don't know if you remember this language. And, and now I it's like that. two years to flatten the curve. But there's also some mathematical illiteracy there. I mean, you, you flatten the curve, you change the shape of the curve, but not the number under the curve. So in a sense, it was harmful and pushed the tail out. Yeah, so... Uh, so the flattening the curve is, 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 so that just means that you're just pushing it forward. Right, you're pushing the tail into yeah. the future. Okay, yeah. And there was one rationale for that, because you don't want everybody to be sick at the same time. 
because then you don't have enough hospital beds. Of course. So so there was some rationale, I think, in the very beginning of spring to sort of try to flatten the curve, especially by protecting the older people who were the ones who were going to the hospitals. But there was some rationale for that to not over, not have everybody being sick at the same time. Yeah, the key. In- but, af- but after those two weeks or four weeks or whatever, I didn't see any rationale at all for doing any of these measures. No, I didn't either. And, and protecting the old people from the very beginning, I think, should have been the strategy. Correct, yeah. So you left Harvard recently, and you've joined the Brownstone Institute as its senior scientific director. And uh, for those who don't know about Brownstone, it was founded in 2021 to respond to the COVID crisis and provide, quote, a safe haven for scientific research. What do you hope to accomplish uh, with your work at Brownstone? So it's a new initiative, and I think that we are facing a crisis in uh, universities and academia with the way that we have dealt with this pandemic. And maybe I see it uh, more because I'm in public health, and I don't think it's uh, we don't see the same thing maybe in, in other areas. But I think it's a it's a problem, and I think. It's a shock to me, for example, that universities will not recognize immunity after recovering from uh, from a disease because we have known it for so long. So I think uh, we have some work to do after the pandemic is over. We have, we have, of course, we have to try to get back in track of public health and recover the lost uh, lost aspect there, and also with the economy and so on. But I think we also have to look at uh, academia and see how academia operates. I think one problem we have seen within the public health is that one narrative became very dominant. And I think they are sort of, uh, I think science has become very centralized. So if you have, for example, Anthony Fauci, who is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, so he sits on the biggest pile of infectious re- disease research money in the world. And he's friends with Jeremy Farrar in. Uh, England, who is the head of the director of the Wellcome Trust, which is one of the biggest private funding agencies of medical research, uh, as well as with uh, Christian Drosten, another friend of theirs in Germany. So there was like a small group of people who somehow came up with this lockdown idea, even though they don't have much experience with public health. They're more like lab scientists with virology and immunology. But because they sit on these huge amounts of research funding, it's very difficult for other scientists to speak up against them because that puts their own livelihood and the livelihood of and the well-being of the lab, lab and their research group at stake. So I think one thing we have to do in science is to have it less centralized and more decentralized so that we don't get these small groups of people who sort of set the narrative and then don't allow other scientists to have uh, uh, differing opinions. Yes, uh, and, and uh, I totally agree with you. It's very hard uh, when you're on these committees as well, you know, these scientific boards, uh, government boards. It's very, very hard. You, you, you typically know what the answer is they're searching for, you know, and um, it takes courage uh, if your funding comes from that agency to in any way dissent. And it's particularly hard for universities, uh, which aren't showing much backbone these days. So shifting topics a little bit, but not entirely, you know, kind of picking up on what we're just talking about in a sense, you know, these are really interesting times we're living in where information and even scientific data is much more broadly available than at really any other time in history. And, you know, we've talked about this narrow group of so-called experts setting a mono policy or a, a single sort of view with respect to COVID. Uh, But this wide availability of data has allowed non-medical experts. So these people are often engineers and computer scientists and physicists, uh, mathematicians, and often to look at medical research data. It's not just in COVID. I see it across a lot of medical data. And, um, you know, they're looking at medical research data and they're applying very robust analysis, sometimes much better and more sophisticated mathematical analysis than we see in the typical paper. And they look at preprint materials as well as peer-reviewed studies that have already happened. And not infrequently, these, quote, non-experts have observations at odds with the medical orthodoxy. And I'm wondering what you make of these folks. I mean, uh, I've had people tell me these folks are dangerous. 
But um, when I look at their analysis, it's often quite sophisticated mathematically. They might not have medical expertise, but in terms of letting the data speak, sometimes they're quite impressive. Others feel they should be strongly censored, and many already have been censored. I wonder if you have thoughts on this phenomena. I don't think we should censor them. I think uh, we should welcome people to look at data in different, uh, different ways. And if they have some good, uh, interesting, novel conclusions from them, we should be excited about that and praise them for that. And if we think they do something nutty or crazy, then we should say, well, I don't agree with this conclusion because of this or that. Right. And that's, I think, how science operates. And science is not like a clear thing. If, if you want to sort of know what's right and wrong, maybe religion is a better thing to do than science. But uh, I think we have to welcome other people coming into the scientific community. And I think from my personal experience, having people from different fields sort of going into a new area is often very fruitful because they have they they think things from a different perspective. Exactly. And that can be very helpful and very productive. Yes. It's not just a re relationship to COVID, as I mentioned. It's it's broad, you know. But uh, when I see these negative responses to some of these people, really excellent work with the data in some cases, it's almost a kind of appeal to authority. You know, there's a, a fallacious reasoning called appeal to authority, you know, in logic. And, uh, you know, they'll say, well, uh, this is all very clever and quite compelling, but this fellow's an engineer or this fellow's a physicist. He's, he or she is not a, for example, a health uh, expert or a medical physician or uh, a population researcher. And I, I, that's sort of like an appeal to authority, which is one of the weakest forms of argument. I think so. And I just to give one example about COVID, one, uh, I think he's in the mathematics department in Carnegie Mellon. His name is Wes Pegden. He's done some very insightful and uh, interesting uh, analysis of uh, COVID data. So that's one example of somebody who is not, hasn't been in medicine, who is now sort of entering the field and making very uh, uh, important or productive contributions. So th that's just one example of many. Absolutely. I, um, I agree. Now, we know that the outbreak of this uh, pandemic has dominated a lot of your attention for the past couple of years. But I understand that there is something that worries you even more than COVID-19, and that is your teenage son that you mentioned earlier, learning to drive the family car. So how is he doing? And more importantly, how are you doing with this? Well, I was very worried, uh, as most parents are, but uh, I'm going to be very honest that he is actually a more careful driver than I am. Wow, that's great. So uh, I am, uh, yeah, so... That's a huge relief. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, I'm very glad that he doesn't copy me on that aspect. Uh, uh. So, from when I went, from when I was that age. So, right. We. Uh, it's always amazing when you look back at uh, your youth that you uh, lived to be the age you are now. Yeah. Well, Martin, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today, and uh, I particularly want to wish you super good luck with your new initiatives at the Brownstone Institute. This kind of thing has to happen. Expecting academia to change without outside groups engaging, I think, is unlikely. So I'm a big supporter of what you're doing, and uh, I hope it's a wild success. Thank you so much. I think it will be interesting times that we're heading into. Uh, we are, and uh, I hope they're interesting in the good sense of interesting. And really appreciate your time with us today, Mark. Thank you for a delightful conversation. I really appreciate having me on. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thanks. STEM talk. 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 Well, that was an interesting interview. I think one of the best takeaways today was Martin's point about the collateral damage of lockdowns and school closings. But more broadly, it's important to note that science does not proceed by consensus or adherence to an official sanctioned narrative. Quite the opposite, actually. Further, it is sad that even something like a virus has been politicized. Fortunately, Martin is one of the few objective, informed, and clear thinkers on this subject. And that is something I really appreciate. If you enjoyed this interview as much as I did, I hope you'll visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and the other episodes 
at stemtalk.us. This is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.